Well, this morning we do have an opportunity now to come to First Timothy, and it's a wonderful, wonderful chapter for us to be engaging in this morning. Uh, it is also a very niche chapter in a sense that many of you might not heard this message preached ever in your life, and this will be the first time you ever hear it preached, which is how do we uh, interact and care for widows within God's church. <laughs> so let's turn to First Timothy chapter 5, verse 11 through 16. As, uh, as uh, um, rare as this passage is in your hearing, as we are going to investigate, this actually is very relevant to our lives. Uh, we're going to be in verse 11 through 16, but let's really take it up from verse 9 and read this together. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to it because uh, you might not be back here from verse 9, um, but we will uh, take up from verse 9 as we get the proper context of this passage. It says, Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows. For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some had already strayed after Satan. For if any believing woman have relatives who are widows, let, them, let her care for them, that the church not be burdened, so that ye may care for those who are truly widows. Let's bow in the word of prayer. Our Father, we are thankful that we get to participate in this passage in which we are learning from it. And we know, Lord, that your word is profitable for teaching, for rebuke, uh, for training, and for correcting in righteousness. And we know, Lord, that even this passage, we all have something to learn, even though it is referring to a segment of women, a very uh, small segment even to say of widows. Uh, we do know, the Lord, that what from what principles that we can learn from this passage, we could definitely apply to our lives, especially for women. We thank you. We pray that you will open our eyes and open our ears to hear wonderful truth from your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Historically, women have dedicated their lives in an official way within the church setting. In the beginning of uh, history of the church, there has been a group of women called Nona. Nona is a Latin term to refer to an older woman who is grandmother age. And this term is also referred to a woman who had dedicated her life to the Lord in the official service of God's church. Over time, this word, when translated to the English language, became the word nun. Uh, eventually, women wanted to dedicate themselves to the service of God's church. They would dedicate themselves within the Catholic church setting as nuns. And these women have abdicated or even uh, just simply said, we're not going to get married. Uh, we're going to forsake the possibility of marriage and raising children. And we're going to complete our lives in the rest of our lives in the service of God's church to the Lord. Originally, what we found out is that this particular role of service was for older women, such as the word nana would indicate to us it was for older women. However, over the course of the history, especially as the Catholic Church began to reestablish itself in the history of the church in the Middle Ages, what we found out is that many of the younger women have become nuns as well, even though, as we're going to see particularly from 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11 through 16, they should be focusing on something else, which is also great for their lives, namely marriage and raising children and managing their homes. For the older woman, however, it was a wonderful, wonderful occasion. Instead of stepping back, instead of kicking back, instead of retiring in some kind of Mediterranean home, uh, in a Mediterranean island, they're going to say, you know what, I'm going to kick it up a notch, I'm going to give my life to the Lord, my house is empty, my children are gone, now I'm alone by myself, I'm going to serve the Lord. This, however, was not a calling for younger women, as we're going to see in this passage. 
There is a different calling for younger women, as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11 through 16, which also is a very noble calling. A calling which they themselves are going to grow in the Lord because of that. A calling in which themselves are going to glorify the Lord because of it. And it is the calling of marriage and raising children. The reason why marriage and raising children is such a wonderful calling for women is because marriage itself is an example of how Christ loves the church and how church loves Christ. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, these words, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husband. There is a wonderful picture of how wives are to submit to their husband as a reflection of how the church is to submit to Christ. As people look at you and your marriage to your husband, they're seeing the love of the church to Jesus himself. So therefore, in this sense, there's great purpose for women in marriage. There's also great praise from God when women choose to get married. He says in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10, An excellent wife who can find, she's far more precious than jewels. This is a wonderful, wonderful praise from God. God is saying if you are a wife and if you are an excellent wife, you are more precious than jewels. Not only are you receiving praise from God, you also are receiving praise from your husband and your children. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 28 says these words, Her children rise up early and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. There's great appreciation from your family members if you choose this path of marriage and raising children. Not only is she receiving her praise from God himself and from her husband and also from her children, she's also receiving praise from people who are outside, people who are leaders in the city. It says in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 31, Give her the fruit of her hands, let her works praise her in the gates. Those who are in the gates are those who are leading the city, those who are the elders. They even see her work and they praise her. So giving these praises from God and praise from the family members and praise also from those who are ruling in the city, we see the great calling for women to be married and to be mothers and to manage their home as a way of glorifying God. And it's exactly what Paul is indicating to the church of Ephesus here in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Here in this chapter, Paul is going to give some instruction to women, especially for younger women in terms of their aspiration for their lives. Women oftentimes are pointed to different things. They could be pointed to their career. They could be pointed to uh, their uh, ministry full-time. They could be pointed to different kind of things which may promise them some kind of um, praise and some kind of usefulness and some kind of recognition in this world. But what God is saying here is this. If you choose to be married, if you choose to raise up children, you choose to manage your home, you will receive great recognition before God and before others. And so, therefore, your aspiration should be of such. Three aspirations we're going to see today for younger women here in this passage. First aspiration is the aspiration for marriage. We're to aspire to marriage. We see this in verse 11 to verse 12. It says these words. But refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. And so as we come to this passage, we're finding out this principle of marriage. Now, of course, this is a very niche principle because this very principle is hidden within the principle of caring for widows within God's church, which is even more of a niche principle, which we see here in the structure of 1 Timothy. However, as we really see here in this passage is that God is actually instructing this church on a major principle how to be a healthy church. Timothy now has been pastoring this church for a number of years, or actually when Paul just left. And Paul is leaving Timothy now to this time of when Timothy gets to be a senior pastor. And Timothy needs to make sure that certain things within the church are in check. Uh, number one, the church needed to have doctrinal purity. This is something which we saw in chapter one, in which the church needed to be doctrinally pure. There were those who were teaching a different doctrine, so Timothy is to, to stop them, needs to tell them not to teach any different doctrine so that the pure doctrine of the gospel can flourish within God's church. People are hearing the gospel and applying the gospel to their lives. 
Not only, though, is the church need to be doctrinally pure, the church also needed to be a church of right purpose before God and before this world. That is why in chapter 2, Paul is instructing Timothy to make sure the church is arriving at the place in which it is praying for the salvation of all, especially for those who are in governing authority and those who are in this community wishing to reach all with the gospel. Then in chapter 3, what we saw is that the church needed to have the right leaders. The church needed to make sure that those who are qualified are within the leadership structure of God's church. Uh, this is seen in the establishment of elders and the establishment of deacons within God's church. The elders needed to be above reproach. The deacons need to be dignified, not double toned And we saw a list of qualifications over a period of few weeks uh, as we studied for both the qualification of elders and deacons. And we've done that. And we saw that the leaders of God's church need to be pure in their lives, pure in their conduct. And then in chapter 4 and chapter 5, what we saw is the tone of the leadership. The leadership tone needs to be that a strong tone in the sense that it is standing for Christ. As Timothy is called to have this strong leadership tone, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, that Timothy is to command and to teach. He is not to be ashamed of the gospel. People may question what he's teaching or even resist them in terms of what he's saying. But as long as he's teaching the word of God, he is to be confident in that. He is also, as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, to let no one despise him for his youth, but set believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and also in purity. He is to live his life in purity, in faith, in love, and set example, and let no one despise him, look down on him because of his youth. So therefore, there must be confidence in Timothy's own teaching, his own life. In that very setting, we also see that Timothy needed to be gentle in his approach to the people of God. This is where we come to chapter 5. So chapter 4 is doctrinal purity, strong leadership. Chapter 5 is about gentleness as how Timothy should approach the body of Christ. In verse 1, we see that he is not to rebuke. The word is sharply rebuke or sharply put down an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. He is to not to sharply rebuke a younger man or younger men, as, younger men as brothers, or older women as uh, not to do that, but to treat them as brothers, not to sharply rebuke older women, but to treat them as mothers, not to sharply rebuke younger uh, women, but to treat them as sisters in all purity. This has to do with Timothy's heart attitude, the gentleness as he approached various members within the body of Christ. He needed to make sure that he is approaching them with sincerity, with truthfulness, but also in love. In this very setting, we're coming to a very small segment of people within God's church that needed to be especially treated with love, and those are the widows within God's church. The reason why widows need to be treated with special love within God's church is because widows are extremely vulnerable within God's church. Uh, they're vulnerable actually within this world in general, given the fact that money and uh, jobs do not come easily for widows. There are not many jobs that which were made for women back in the days of Paul. Most of the work are made for men, and men are considered to be the primary workforce in that world. And so what happens is that when a woman is born to the world, they're under, they're under the authority of their fathers. The fathers would provide for them. However, if the father passes away, the woman becomes an orphan. And that is a horrible state for the woman to be in. So in that very sense, the church is actually called to care for orphans. James chapter 1, verse 27, we have these words. Religion that is pure and defiled before God the Father is this which is to visit orphans. So we see that for women or for children in general who have lost their father, who have no way to provide for themselves, the church is to step in and care for such person. But this does not necessarily indicate that as women grow older, they are not vulnerable anymore. They could still be very vulnerable. As they grow older, as they get married, and they're now under the protection of their husband, say their husband passes away through their work, and that happens all the time. As husbands go out to work, they get robbed, they get killed by robbers, they get drowned in the sea. The women are now vulnerable. 
uh, because they have no one to provide for them, no one to sustain them, or the husband leaves them. As we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it is a possible thing for women to experience this because as women become Christians, the husband may not necessarily want to be with them anymore. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 15 that if that happens to you, you are not enslaved to the marriage. God has called you to peace, so let this person go. Certainly, you can let this person go, but what about your financial sustenance? That is a question that is a problem for the woman to consider. In this very sense, what we see is that the church needed not to just let the woman be out on her own and just figure things out for herself, but the church is to come alongside of that and give few instructions. As Romans chapter 12, verse 15 says, we're to rejoice with those who rejoice, we're to weep with those who weep. And James chapter 1, verse 27 says these words, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. So the church must step in. The church must care for individuals who are in such state because there is a command for us to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep and certain widows in this section of their lives as they are uncared for, as they're not provided for, are those who are weeping. The church is to come alongside of that. As the church come alongside of that, there's a specific way. And the very specific way is not simply just say, you know what, I hope you do well. <laughs> but rather, we're coming alongside in a way of financially caring for such a person. There is a specific physical way that we're not just saying, hey, I hope that you do well, but we're going to come alongside of you and say, we're going to make sure you do well. This is seen in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3, in which women are called to or well, the church is called to be honor widows who are truly widows. Those who are widows are to be honored. This is not a term to mean respect only, but rather this is a term to mean that you're going to financially provide for such women. This is the same word used in Matthew chapter 15, verse 4, which Jesus said, For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. And in the very context of that, you have Jesus saying, Hey, I want you to sustain your father and your mother. I want you to give to them. And the very context of that was that people were giving the money to God, saying, whatever I would give it to you, I would already give it to God, so therefore I do not need to give to you. And Jesus said, you violate the word of God. Support your father. Support your mother. This particular word, honor, is also used in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, in which it says that the elder who will rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Again, this word double honor is a means for us to know that the elder who rules well, the elder who teaches, the elder who leads is worthy of being financially compensated for as he does his full time for his work. So therefore, what we see here is that the word honor means to financially care for an individual. And here you have widows who needed that very financial care. However, that financial care is not something which is without its restrictions and without its conditions. As we see here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, there are a couple of things that the church needed to be aware of before they financially care for a widow. And number one is, we ask the question, does this widow already have someone who is responsible to care for her? This is seen in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 4, it says, But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. Uh, this is extremely important. Before the church pours out its resources to help widows who are in need, we ask the question, are there any other relatives to this widow who should show this kind of godliness to care for this widow? The reason why they should do it is because two reasons. One is their responsibility before God. They're doing this, as verse 4 says, as a demonstration of the godliness. Whether the parent had cared for them before or not, whether the parent had been a good parent or bad parent, the child is to show godliness. There's a commitment to the person whom God has placed in their life as a father and mother in terms of showing some kind of level of care for them and not abandon them at the old age. It's a level of commitment to the Lord as far as why they do this. Another reason why they do this is because, well, if the parents actually did take care of them, they get to make some return to their parents. We see this in verse 4. They get to give back to their parents, and this is a demonstration of show forth of thankfulness to their parent. 
If their parent had cared for them, they get to thank their parent by demonstrating some level of return to them. They should do this because it is biblically commanded for them to do so. Now, if they didn't have any relatives to care for them, does that mean that the church is now to support them? Not necessarily either, because there's a second condition here, is that the woman must live her life as example for all to follow. This list of women in terms of widowhood and being enrolled in this widowhood is not something that which you're just gaining financially. You're also demonstrating a certain sense of godliness and commitment to God and ministry to God in exchange for this kind of financial care. Uh, this is seen in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 9 through 10, in which we're seeing a list of qualifications for widows, almost similar to the very list which we see here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 regarding deacons and elders. It goes to show that this is an informal list of godly women within God's church. Uh, she needs to fulfill these conditions or these qualifications before she is financially supported by God's church. We see the first qualification in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 9, which is that she is the wife of one husband. What we found out is that this means that she is a one-man woman. She is not a flirtatious woman. She respects marriage. When she was married, she lives as a one-man uh, one woman. And after now, she's not married anymore because now she's a widow. She respects marriage. She is one who believes what Hebrews chapter 13 says, Verse 4 says, which is that we would let marriage bed be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled. She's not flirtatious with men, whether they're single or whether they're married. She respects marriage. She, she wants marriage to succeed, and she is not one to break up marriages with her flirtatious act. She's one who loves the condition and also the sanctity of marriage. Second, she also is one who has brought up children. We see this in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 10. And this is not indicating that she must have children of her own. We all know that children are a blessing from God, and many people sought to have children. Even being married was not able to have children for many years, and perhaps for all of their years as a married couple. We do know that children are given by the Lord. Nevertheless, we have this condition here, or this qualification here, is that she has brought up children. Does that mean that widows who do not have children are not qualified? No, we saw that the fact that the children who she cares for does not necessarily mean that they had to be her own children. There are many, many little kids running around the church she could be caring for, right? She could be part of the Sunday school. She could raise up children that are not hers in the sense that she could take care of her nieces and her nephews. She could even take care of orphans as orphans who are abundant in the time of the Roman Empire. She can also be caring for young ladies and discipling them. As Titus chapter 2, verse 3 says, If you're an older woman, this is your life. You ought to be reverent in behavior, not slanderous to slaves or slaves to much wine. You are to teach what is good and to train younger women to love their husband and their children. And so this is an aspiration for older women is that you're investing in a younger generation. So that's the qualification for you in order for you to be supported financially by God's church. And those are two qualifications so far. And the third one is hospitable. The woman is hospitable. And it's word xenos and philos put together, which means love for strangers. This does not necessarily mean that you love any stranger you're, that, that is in front of you and that you're going to Certainly, we do love them in the sense that we want them to know the Lord. But the very way in which this was practiced back in the days of Paul is that you would invite people who are believers who come and visit the church who need a time of rest into your home and provide a time of respite and rest for them. This is exactly what it means to be hospitable back in the days of Paul. Now, we know that this is something which we can only do limitedly in a way because some of our homes allow for a certain amount of people. Some are allowed for more people. Some allow for less people. However, this particular heart attitude must be present within the woman's life. She does not necessarily have to invite a whole bunch of people to her home because in that sense, she is not able to take care of them adequately enough, and she doesn't want that because she was not able to wash the feet of the saints. If you have 30 people in your home, you can't do that for all 30 people. You want to be hospitable. You want to have people feel welcome, and so you invite as much as you can to your home and have it be a time of respite for them. If you didn't ha have a home to invite people to, and perhaps a woman will invite them out to lunch or to coffee or for a drink or whatever to 
to help him feel comfortable. This is a woman who will approach another person across the pews who is a newcomer and have the person say, hey, how are you? How, how, or go to the person and say, how are you? I know that I know this is your first time here. How can I serve you? Uh, my name is so-and-so. I'd love to uh, just get to know you. How did you find this church? And so many times I would visit churches and nobody comes and talks to me, right? We all have that experience. But when you have a woman in the church who does this, right, she makes, uh, she makes the new visitor feel very, very comfortable because she has the hard attitude of hospitality. So not only is she hospitable, as we see here, and not only does she train up younger children, and not only is she a, a one-man woman, she's also one, as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 10, who washes the feet of the saints. And this is a, a, a euphemism or a description, a metaphor, to say that this is a person who actually takes care of the needs of people, to give them a time of rest, to give them a time of refreshment. Uh, when people come and visit your home, they need to also have certain amenities in order for them to feel cared for. So she invites people to their home, not just stuffing them to their home, but actually provides for them, cares for them so they feel comfortable and rested for the night so that they can move on. Uh, if the day calls them to move on, they are feeling refreshed because of her service to them. And then lastly, what we saw in verse 10 is that she cares for the afflicted. She has a general care for those who are suffering within God's church. So with these five qualifications, what we found out is that the woman who is to be supported by the church are to meet these five qualifications prior to her support. She not only has to be a one who has no one to be taken care of in terms of those who would take care of her, she also has to be godly in such a way because she is functioning as an example for the entire church of God as a godly woman in ministry. In that very sense, Paul says in verse 9, she would be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age. Why 60 years of age? The reason why is because she has lived a lifelong lesson of practicing this, demonstrating this. And also because she's not a young woman. A young woman tend not to have the experience as she would have if she had not lived this life for a long period of time. That's why Paul said in verse 11, but refused to enroll younger widows. Here is the passage. But when the passion draws them away from Christ, they desire to marry. This is one of the most interesting passages that you can find in Scripture. Paul is not necessarily discriminating between younger women and older women, saying younger women are immature. But Paul is saying as a young woman, you would have certain inclinations in your heart, in your makeup, that will cause you to stumble later on in life if you chose this pathway of widowhood, in which you are saying to God, if you chose this pathway, you're saying to God, God, I will never get married. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to dedicate myself to ministry. I'm going to make myself available to ministry to such a degree the church is going to depend upon me for the work of ministry. But in exchange, I'm going to get financially, financially supported, but I'm not going to get married. Well, Paul says that actually would not be the most wise choice for younger women because of the inner desire which they would have as years go by. So for a younger widow, what naturally would happen is that they lose their husband, say if the husband has been a wonderful husband, has been a great husband, they're thinking, you know what, I'll never ever find anyone like him ever again. So they're saying, you know what, I'm done with marriage. I'm going to be thinking about this as my only marriage. I'm going to God. I'm going to serve God forever or for the rest of my life. And then they end up changing their mind two years later because of the biological desire in their makeup. They want now to have a man in their life. We all could experience this. Women certainly can experience this. Or they may have a horrible marriage, and in that horrible marriage, they're saying that, no, I've done this, I've done that, I don't want this ever again in my life. I'm going to serve God full time. But then two years later, they again want to get married. But that is in competition to what they already committed themselves to. You see, they already committed themselves to ministry. They're saying to the church, you can depend upon me. I'm going to be working for God 24-7. I'm going to be visiting homes. I'm going to be doing this work of ministry as a secretary, as one who does this and does that, as a deaconess, as one who serves the food. And the church has largely depended on their work. And the church almost couldn't live without their work. And they're now in a place where they're saying, okay, well, I want to get married again, but that will mean that I must step back from this work, which the church is now expecting me to do. So in their own minds, they're saying, you know what? I'd rather just suppress this feeling. 
I'm not going to get married. I'm going to suppress this desire to get married so I could do God's work. But the reality is that they will not ever fully be able to suppress that as that feeling keeps coming back over and over again. So what they end up happening is that they end up placing themselves in the place of temptation unnecessarily, unnecessarily. They, something, they were doing something that is good. They were involved in something that's wonderful, but that something wonderful has become a temptation for them. To the degree, this is what happens in verse 11. It says, but refusing world younger widows, because why? For their passion draws them away from Christ and they desire to marry. Now, we know that there's nothing wrong with marriage. Paul actually encouraged marriage in verse 14. I would have younger widows marry. But what does it mean when their passion draws them away from Christ? Well, it is because their intellectual understanding of what they need to do is different from their biological understanding of what they want to do. So they're serving in ministry, they're dedicating full time to God, and all of a sudden they're attracted to this man, and this man is attracted to her. But then in their intellectual understanding, they're saying, okay, we shouldn't be together, we shouldn't ever get married, but they're getting closer and together in ministry. And working together, what ends up happening oftentimes in that setting is that they fall into sin, fall into sexual sin. That could have been avoided if they just simply get married. Or another scenario could happen, which is that she is sort of this untouchable woman in the church. People are seeing her as a godly woman. People are seeing her as a woman who has dedicated herself to God, and she is financially supported by the church, and so she's not considering a marriage. So none of the men at the church pursue her because they're thinking that she's not available. But there are also not just men within the church, but men outside of the church who do not necessarily know her that she has made such commitment. So she's, they're seeing this wonderful young lady who's going about house to house and serving, and she is uh, very, very attractive, and people who are outside of the church, unbelievers now pursue her. And she having this desire to have a man in her life, seeing, thinking that no man in the church is pursuing her, she's now opening herself up to those who are unbelievers in her life and getting married to them, perhaps. And in this way, their passions, as verse 11 says, draw them away from Christ to lead them to what verse 12 says, incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith, having abandoned to some degree their commitment to the Lord. What was good in the very beginning of commitment to God, commitment to live for God for the rest of our life actually end up incurring condemnation against them. So Paul says, do not allow younger widows to enroll in this widowhood. Let them raise family as verse 14 says, marry, bear children, manage their household, because that is a life in which they will receive tremendous blessing from God, in which all these temptations could be avoided. You do not want to ruin a young woman's life by allowing them to go through this process of temptation. Let them have their own husband, let them have their own children, let them manage their own household so that they could be in a place of joy and satisfaction as they serve God within the church. And this is a wonderful, wonderful way to glorify God as well. Of course, this way of glorifying God is something that's been challenged in our situation, challenged within the church. Many women feel that they don't need to get married and they don't want to get married and they feel that they could serve God or go out in the career field and be a doctor and be a lawyer and pursue these things. And it's something which women could be inclined to do in their younger age. However, women do change their minds, and if they do change their minds and eventually embrace marriage, I would suggest that that is a blessing for them. I remember, I remember back in the days in which I was at UCLA, and uh, I had many, many friends who were women who were coming into UCLA, and people, these women, and they're coming from well-to-do families, and they're paying tens and thousands of dollars for this education here at UCLA so that they could become a doctor, so they can become a lawyer, so they become an engineer, and so they could become all these things that they wanted to be so that they can live this career-oriented life. And I remember that this very passage in the church I was going to, and it's a solid uh, biblical church, and they were preaching this very passage, and many of the women in their teens, in their 20s, are really, really struggling with this, saying that, you know what, you mean that after I spend tens and thousands of dollars and studying and, and, and getting a job, getting, and getting education, getting a job, all of this is point to that I would just be a housewife or be a someone's wife and, and raise, manage, and children and do all these things, and you mean that I'm going to just do that? If that that's the case, now what's the point of me going to college? What's the point of me studying? What's the point of me getting an education? I'm not saying they shouldn't. 
I'm not saying women shouldn't get an education. I'm not saying, saying women shouldn't work. Obviously, as we know in our lives, we're not in a arranged marriage setting in which women will establish themselves as a married person immediately because we all need to be put together by the will of God some way or some form. And some women get to be put together by the will of God with a man at earlier age. For some, it's at a later age. And prior to you being put together by God with a man, you have to work. And the better your job is, the easier your life will be. And so I would encourage women to get an education. I think that's a wonderful thing. But at the same time, when women choose to give up their career for family, I saw this over a period of 20 years as I've known these women when they're in their teens and now they're in their 40s and they're raising children, they have never, ever been happier. It's really true. They give, their educa- they give up their career. They give up the use of the education. They say, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to stay home. I'm going to raise my children. I'm going to love my husband. I'm going to manage this home. They have a great and happy life. I can tell you the truth. And it's a wonderful, wonderful choice they made. The reason why it's a wonderful choice they made is because that's how God created a woman to be in the very first place. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, we see the reason why women were created is so that she could be a helper suitable for men. And in this sense, her husband, she is the one who is helping him. And she finds her fulfillment in that because she is created for that. Now, I'm not saying that for all women that you're going to just marry anyone out there because I think that's a sad, sad thing to do. Many marriages break apart because women had not made the right choice, especially when they marry an unbeliever. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, Paul warned against this, saying the widow can marry, but only in the Lord. You have to make sure you're marrying the right person. But if you do have the right person in the church and the person is a believer, perhaps open yourself up to this person. And the person doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. None of us are perfect. I'm not perfect when I got married. My wife gave me a chance. My wife is not perfect either, right? But we grew together and there's a, a, a sharpening together as we're in marriage. You're not looking for a perfect man. You're just looking for a man who is in the Lord. And then you're now going to say, you know what, if this man allows me to live this life which God calls me to live, which is that I will be in the home, I will manage the home, I will raise children, I will love the husband, and also the husband will appreciate me for the work which I do. If that is the case, you get to flourish in that way. And so excellent, excellent way to live life for women. Ultimately, as women do this, they're representing the church's love for Christ, as we see in Ephesians 5, verse 25, as Christ loved the church, the church also loves Christ by submitting to the church, uh, submitting to him. So therefore, we see this important principle, which is that women can find great satisfaction, great enjoyment in life through marriage. It is something that is worthy to be aspired to. Not only do they aspire to marriage, they can also aspire to manage a home. They can aspire to manage a home. We see this in verse 13 to 15. It says this. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their household, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some had already strayed after Satan. So this very passage that we see here is Paul is giving the second reason why do not enroll a younger widow into this official list of widowhood in which they're committing their lives for the rest of their lives to the service of the Lord and saying, I'm not going to get married anymore. The reason why they shouldn't do that is because it is not most beneficial for them in their walk with God and so not beneficial for the church. The church need to have godly women in place of ministry and not women who do not know what they're doing in ministry. And tend to be is that young women do not have the experience in life to do the right thing in terms of ministry because they themselves have not raised a family. They have not raised children, which are all training grounds for ministry. So besides that, that's what Paul says in verse 13, they learn to be idlers because they do not know exactly what they should do, what should say, but they're also compelled to do the ministry. They're going from house to house, as we see in verse 13, going about from house to house, meeting with people, but their very very work is really non-essential. Their communication is not essential. They're not really encouraging people to follow Jesus in the right way, or they do not really know what to say, so they're just hanging out with people. They're idlers. They're those who are really not contributing to the well-being, the health of the church, so they're really not necessary. Not only are they idlers, they're 
also contributing in a negative way. They're being counterproductive in verse 13. It says they become gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. Gossip is when they have information and they're just telling other people about that information. You shouldn't do that. As a pastor, you guys tell me information. I, if it's not information that comes to me in the right way, I forget about it. I do. People come to me and say, hey, so-and-so did this to me. Why don't you go and tell so-and-so that they shouldn't do that to me anymore? And I say, no, I don't do that. You should do that. Matthew chapter 18 says this. If a brother offends another brother, the one who is offended, go and tell the brother alone. It's not the pastor that passed the message. If I do that, I become a gossiper. So therefore, when I hear something like that and someone speaks badly about another member within the church body, what I do, I, if it doesn't come to me in the right way, I forget about it. I even pretend that I never heard it. This is what it means to be a godly leader in God's church. So I don't gossip. I just don't do anything with that information. I forget about that information. Because why? Because that information did not come to me the right way. It has to arrive to me in the right way through the Matthew 18 process. You go and tell that brother. If the brother doesn't listen to you, you bring two or three other brothers with you. Go tell that brother again. If the brother still doesn't listen to you, then maybe you come talk to me. I will arrive in the group along with that brother, along with you, so that everyone can talk about this and find out what the biblical principle is in terms of how we should live our lives. So I would not be involved in gossip within God's church. However, for these younger women, because of their eagerness to help, they may not realize this. They might say, you know what? I have a lot of time. I could pass messages. This person says this. They don't want to talk to this person. So I'll take what this person says. I'll bring it to this person. And that person hear it. And I'll have this person hear what this person says. And I'll bring it back to this person. What ends up happening is that you just create this animosity between two people and you're trapped in between because now you're misrepresenting people and now you're slandering people in the process or defaming people in the process. You're being counterproductive because you're not having them meet together. You also become busybodies. The word busybody is the word that means to pry into the lives of another person. It's also a word that means to practice magical arts. It's interesting in that is word perergos, which means that you're prying into the spiritual realm. Right, magic is prying into the spiritual realm unless you're doing some kind of sleight of hand that's just a very fast movement of your hand. Some people in the past, in the days of Paul, saying seeing magic as prying into the spiritual realm because you're doing something which no other human beings can do. Well, gossip and busybody is doing the same thing. You're prying into business that is not yours. Right, you're prying into it. You're trying to get information out of people. You're saying, hey, what is about this? What about that? How do you feel about this? You're, you're trying to get information out while that information is really unnecessary for you. Right? It doesn't contribute to the well-being of the body of Christ. So don't do that. You're creating more problems than solving them. But because these women have a lot of time, they're creating a bunch of problems within God's church. So God says to these women in verse 14, I want you to have some training ground. Manage your home first. Manage your own home. Learn how to care for people who are your own children. And from that, as you do it for a number of years, maybe then you will know how to care for adults who are women. That's why it says, verse 14, I will have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their household. Get married. Have this as your training ground. Bear children, raise up children, have that as your training ground. Manage your household, learn to do that well in your life. Learn to do that well in your surrounding, in your system. The word manage is the word, two words put together actually. The word oikos, which is house, and the word despoteo, which is the word despot. Interesting, right? Women are to be despot of their homes. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you could be a despot of your home. Like, I don't have a problem with my wife ruling the home. I don't have a problem with my wife telling me this is how the home goes. Why? It's not that she didn't respect my leadership. It's just that she's at home most of the time, and I respect her for that, right? She is managing the home. She is taking care of the home. She's saying this is the way it's best to be done so that me as a husband, all that I really need coming back home is a safe and a comfortable place and place I can rest, place I can be with the kids. And she's managing that and I want to respect her decision for that. She is to do that. And when she does it well, then she grows in her spiritual maturity. And then later on in life, she wants to be involved in the ministry and she still can. She doesn't necessarily have to be enrolled in this list of widowhood. She could still be involved in ministry. She would do that much a better job in ministry, having experienced the management of her home through the loving of her husband and the caring for her own children. In this very setting, we see in verse 14, she does as well. 
she gives the adversary no occasion for slander. Right? If you are messing up the church through gossip, through being busybody, through being an idler, then you're giving the adversary, the devil, an occasion to slander. So do not let women be in a position where they would hurt themselves and hurt God's church. As verse 15 says, for some have already strayed after Satan. Some have already lost their direction. Some have already married an unbeliever. Some have already fallen into sexual sin. Some have already been idlers. Some have already been gossips. Some have already been those who are busybodies. Some are already straight after Satan. So prepare the women in a church, especially young women, for what is best for them. Set them up in the right way. Because marriage and also raising children is a high aspiration for the Lord, especially even here in this world. I was doing a research on how many hours it takes to become excellent at a practice, excellent at a job. There's actually a study by Mal Malcolm Gladwell uh, regarding this very topic. He said that it takes about 10,000 hours to become an expert at a particular job. 10,000 hours of continual practice. A violin player takes about 10,000 hours from the beginning of their practice of their childhood in which they start to learn the instrument to a person who is prof playing professionally. It takes about 10,000 hours for them to reach that state. This person also said for the Beatles to become nationally known, it took about 10,000 hours of them playing in front of people. Of course, people have challenged this notion because some jobs require more than 10,000 hours. A surgeon said that it requires more than 10,000 hours for me to perfect my role. In my residency alone, the surgeon says, in that five years, I spent about 16,000 hours, and that's just only residency, and I'm still learning. How about a mother? A mother comes up and says, well, my job requires many more than 10,000 hours. In that very first year, if your kids wake up as often as they do, as mine does, you're spending about 8,000 hours a year, first year alone as a mother, learning how to do that job. In that very first year, you're still considering yourself a basic learner. You're, no, you're nowhere near expertise as being a mother. You're still in the very foundation of what it means to be a mother. But at the same time, it goes to show how high of this calling is that you, after spending 20 years as a mother, if you have your kids spread out, you would have spent 160,000 hours in a particular role. And at that time, you begin to get a good feel for it. And that is the reason why God said in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10, an excellent wife who can find. She's far more precious than jewels. There's a reason why it's so hard to find an excellent wife because whenever we read through the, math, uh, to the, the Proverbs 31 passage, we're looking at all the things the mother does, and we're saying, you know what? These are impossible things. Right? She, she's going out there. She is uh, making some money at home, and she is, she's uh, trading, and she is uh, taking care of her children, and she's feeding them. She's caring for her husband. She's uh, uh, dressing up the home. She's making sure the home is warm. She's, she's doing all these things in the home. I mean, it's an impossible woman. But then at the same time, if you consider this woman perhaps having spent 160 hours perfecting her role, then all of a sudden that becomes relatively easy to believe that a woman can get to that point, which is that you're doing all these things, but everything kind of adds together, everything are compounded together, and everything are done in such a way that they contribute to each other, to the well-being of your husband, well-being of your children, well-being of your home. It takes practice to do this, and it's a high aspiration. It's an elevated aspiration for women. That is why God praises her. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 30 says this, Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But the woman who fears the Lord, she is to be praised. She is praised by God. She is praised by her husband. In Proverbs chapter 31, verse 28, her children rises up and call her blessed. Her husband also call her blessed. In verse 31, you have the people outside of her home praising her. Her works are praised in her, or her works praise her in the gates. Those who are in the gates are those who are ruling as elders, those who are leaders in the city. Even they see the impact of her through the management of her home. So we see here having women getting married, manage their home is a high aspiration for women. And then lastly, we see the third aspiration, which is that she can care for other women as she does so. She cares for other needy women. 
In verse 16, it says this, But if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them, let the church not be burdened, so that it may care for those who are truly widows. So, so here is a third aspiration. See, back in the days of Paul, if you're not married, you are not necessarily provided for, and it's hard for you to get a job, and so you are poor, like anyone else is poor. But if you got married, you have someone providing for you, then from that provision, you get to provide for other women who are in need. And that's what I believe verse 16 is talking about. He's talking about not just any believing woman, but a believing woman, younger woman, who choose to get married, who choose to live in this life, domesticated life in which she herself has been provided for and caring for the home. Now she has a foundation to care for other people who are widows. It says in verse 16, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Now this is a woman who is cared for and now she gets to care for any relatives who are widows and this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for her to participate in because as she does this, the church does not have to take care of her nor the widow who needs care. It says this, let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows, those who really have no one else to care for. The church is freed up. The woman is happy and joyful living her life, and she gets to care for her relatives who are widows. It's a plus for every person who are involved, for every person who is involved. We see this particularly in the story of Ruth and Naomi, right? In the Bible, in the book of Ruth, you have two widows coming back to Israel. Both are destitute. You have Ruth who, left, uh, who lost her husband. You have Naomi who also lost her husband, their mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. They're coming back to Israel, and they really are a sad bunch. They didn't have money. They didn't have food. So Ruth had to go and had to pick grains from the field. That's where she met Boaz. And it turns out that Boaz was interested in her, and Naomi is coaching her through the process, right? Go sleep at Boaz's feet. Tell him that she could be redeemed by him if, she, if he wants to. And when Boaz did do that, what happened? Well, Naomi also was cared for, right? Naomi gets to be part of this family as Boaz and Ruth had children. And Naomi gets to be a wonderful grandmother in that sense. She's cared for. It's a wonderful, wonderful biblical illustration of what Paul is addressing here. A woman can care for other women inside God's church. Now, we know this is another illustration. We can, there's another illustration we can find in the New Testament, in the book of Acts. You have the illustration of Dorcas who was caring for other women as she herself. We don't know whether she was a widow or not, but she did care for other women. When she passed away, other women were very, very sad. It said in Acts chapter 9, verse 39, all the widows stood besides him, that is Peter, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. So there's not only an Old Testament example of women caring for women who are in need, you have the New Testament example of women caring for women who are in need. And so today, if you're a woman, you can care for people who are in need. It uh, does not necessarily mean that you have to get married. Certainly you could from your job, and women can get a job these days. They could use your, you could use your finances to care for other women who are not able to be, uh, to be sustained on their own efforts. This is something which the Bible calls women to do as love for the body of Christ. In this very sense, what we see here is that this is not a condemnation for women who do go and get a job. We do know that the women do work. We see Lydia, who is a maker of, the, uh, of, of, of cloth and of blue cloth, and we have various examples of women who did work and do a wonderful, wonderful job. But what Scripture tells us is this, is that women are to focus on their home. This is not a Christian liberty. If you do have a job, do it well. But if God calls you to marriage, and if you do have a home to maintain, focus on that home. It's not a Christian liberty to do so. Rather, it's a spiritual command that women should do so. This is seen in Titus chapter 2, verse 4, right? It says the older women are to train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husband so that the word of God may not be reviled. This should be the aspiration for women is that you may get a job, you may do a wonderful work at your work, but the moment the Lord's called you to marriage and to be a mom, stay home and focus on that. It is too often that women work 40 to 60 hours a week and come back home and have absolutely no energy for their children at all. And their children are suffering. They're working hard to do the work outside of their home and giving their children out to someone else to take care of. 
while the children are not well taken care of. And this is something that we need to talk about, especially here in California, given the fact that the housing cost is so high and many have abdicated this particular role that women are to have, which is that women need to stay at home and care for their children. But the husband are saying, you know what, we can't survive on my income alone. So as you go to work and I go to work and the children are left all by themselves. Well, the scripture is very, very clear about this, which is that the very economic of our society does not negate the scripture command for women to be focused on this. The very scripture command is that women are to focus working at home if God has given them a home. There is no compromise in this very command. It's not a suggestion. It's for the woman to aspire to it. It's for the husband to aspire to it as well so that they can prepare their wives to succeed in such a way. Can you, as a husband, mention this at the end of your marriage or the end of whatever setting in which you have when the children are grown up, to say the same thing as the husband does in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 29, many women have done excellently, but you excel them all. Have you prepared your wives to succeed in such a way? I think that is a question to be asked. We must, as husbands, prepare our wives to fulfill the biblical command of God and not put her in a position where she is not able to because she works too much. Therefore, what we see here is that women are to focus working at home. And in this, she makes great contribution to the church of God. She makes great contribution to the kingdom of God, especially as she raises up godly children who will be that force for the new generation to follow God. In this way, we see God places tremendous blessing upon women if women choose to follow Christ in such a way. See, God favors women. God loves women. God uses women. It was women who demonstrated that God can heal the chronically ill in the person who touched Jesus' robe and was healed. It was another woman who begged Jesus for salvation and who was a doctor, and God forgave her, demonstrating that God has mercy upon the most sinful person of all. It was a woman who demonstrated that Jesus resurrected from the dead. They were the first ones to see Christ rise from the dead. God loves women and God favors women. Not that women would become like men in their role, but rather women would be women. In that very sense, God uses them according to his might and according to his power. As Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's not by the woman's might, not by the woman's power, not by their own strength, but by God's spirit as God uses them for his glory as they embrace this life of womanhood in the home that the Lord uses them tremendously for his glory. We see women used by God all the time in the biblical history. and We pray that many of the women will embrace that life as we're convicted by what God says here. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that we get to touch this passage because this is a rare passage and oftentimes we avoid talking about it because uh, we don't want to offend anyone but because we're preaching expo expositionally through scripture we have to touch it and we have to learn what you have you would have for us here and so we pray that your spirit will guide us and lead us if we, any one of us struggle with this we pray that we would take it up with you and we know, Lord, that you will convict us according to your word because your word is truth. And if we do follow your word, uh, we will experience the blessings which are evident here. So lead us and guide us. Soften our hearts. Let us be humble before you and live by your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.